Please welcome President of Well Entertainment and Board President of Women in Film, Kathy Shulman. Hello, everybody. I know that Katie introduced me and then you saw Franklin, um, but that's okay because he's my alter ego. As a matter of fact, sometimes I think Franklin is me and vice versa, but he is my dearest, dearest friend and we've been deep collaborators in all that we've done. And I'm so glad um, that we had this little video and it'll, it'll, I hadn't seen it before. It'll affect a little bit what I say because he, he covered some of this material in a fabulous way. So let me first thank Pam Jeffords and everybody on the Mercer team for today's event and for the incredible support that you've all shown and and your deep investment in Reframe. Um, Reframe is something that I co-founded uh, with Carrie Putnam, who's the executive director of Sundance Institute, who will be here later this afternoon, I understand, to talk about culture change. Um, so let me roll back for a second as we start today's keynote um, and talk a little bit about the conflation that's happening between sexual harassment, sexual assault, and uh, the discriminatory behaviors leading to the gender parity needs that need to be addressed. And as a matter of fact, I think it was interesting, one of the questions that was just asked here of, of Franklin was, you know, what, what made Reframe start, you know, before the Me Too movement? Um, and so what I wanted to try to point out, because I think it's important that we, we're dealing with a lot of things all at the same time. And they are related and they are also separate. Um, First of all, I think it's really important that we, for, for the moment and for the sake of this particular conversation, I'm going to try to focus us on the media industry because the sexual harassment crisis um, is obviously worldwide. Somebody else may be speaking to that. I'm specifically going to speak to what's happening in our industry so that we can get organized a little bit in our thought pattern today. And, um, you know, the fact is that what we're seeing a lot of in our own industry is sexual harassment. That comes in two forms, as many of you know legally. That is either quid pro quo, which means if you do this, you get that, or it comes in the form in uns of unsafe workplace, meaning it's you can't continue your work without um, facing the fact that you're under sexual pressures. We do think that that's a significant problem here in Hollywood. I personally do not think that sexual assault is as deep of a problem. There isn't evidence to suggest that yet. Um, we do, obviously, we've been hearing things over the, you know, last number of months about instances of that. And within the context of the gender parity movement, the way that we at Reframe um, like to organize our thoughts and think about this, and I suggest we do the same for this conversation, is that Sexual harassment is in many ways in our industry an effect of discriminatory landscape. So when from the top up you're seeing behavior that favors men, disfavors women, lack of inclusion of women, environments are created that in fact harbor bad behavior. And I think it's important that we kind of organize this in a way because what we're going to talk about vis-a-vis -vis reframe is not so much um, how we directly fix sexual harassment, what we're talking about is how to make gender parity occur in the media landscape and when it does, what the good effects of it will be and what we're seeing, you know, even so far. The issues of sex, uh, then let me also further separate sexual harassment from sexual assault. Some of this might have already been done earlier in session today, but clearly sexual assault is what we know as, as, as rape and other deviant crimes. Um, and it's important that when we're using these words that we try not to conflate all of them. Cool? All right. So um, I wanted to talk for a minute um, about what I'm seeing in the field since October 5th. I call October 5th H Day. That's when the first big story from the New York Times hit. Um, the sad story about Harvey Weinstein. And obviously what's going on between October 5th and today is, is momentous. Um, and there has been notable progress. I think we are absolutely seeing within the media industries a demand for diverse lists. Um, we are seeing companies build and more importantly, enable diversity departments more than they ever have before. We are seeing a deeper demand on the limited pipeline of women. And I, the reason I say it that way is 
you'll see that women who you didn't see that were subjected to the gap that exists between job from job to job for women, which, by the way, statistically is five to seven years for a woman working in the gatekeeping positions in film and television. That means producers, writers, directors, cinematographers, editors, and oftentimes composers. The gap for work and the way they fall out is a five to seven year gap, whereas it's a one to three year gap, which is bad enough, by the way, for men. Hard to keep yourself in the business economically. But we are seeing that the few people that have been embraced by the pipeline are working more than they ever were before. We're still struggling with the base of the pipeline. In addition to the demand on the limited pipeline, there is a growing acknowledgement of a diverse consumer base. And there is we're seeing a, 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 a certain flexibility for change in smaller companies and streamers who are very progressive companies. We are seeing the least of that in the bigger companies, which we'll talk about in a minute. And we're also, of course, seeing and sitting here today because there's an outrage you know, against discriminatory and unsafe workplaces from the bottom up. I say from the bottom up. I see outrage everywhere from the bottom up, from those discriminated against, women and diverse people, from those at the bottom of companies, those in the middle of companies. We're going to see a lot less of this outrage from the top. What's flatlined right now in my perception and what I've been able to study and learn about, there is a rejection and an entrenchment from the biggest, most established conglomerates in the business. There is a resistance to making culture change um, with a very deep lack of understanding about how um, biases in culture actually affect decision making, still problematic from the top down. And of course, older white men holding on tight <laughs> and very little or no movement at board levels. The blowback, we I heard some people talking about that, so I've talked about progress, flatline blowback, blowback, which is also crucial, is that we're losing comfort in many cases between men and women and the, in terms of men, male and female cohorts. There's an absolutely perceptible blowback regarding it's a fear if I spend time alone with a younger or more emerging person in my company and I'm a man and they're a woman, what if I get accused? terrible fear of trial by press, which frankly, in my opinion, is out of control at the moment, um, and therefore f further fueling this blowback, um, particularly from men. And unfortunately, a new cronyism with guys sticking together, you know, so as to avoid losing position to, to women um, and also getting in trouble by women. And then Another negative I would even say in a slight blowback is infighting amongst women and various different groups. Um, so um, I, I say all of that because in, in talking about Reframe, which is the subject of today, um, we really wanted, I wanted to touch a little bit on where do we stand as Reframe is entering into the marketplace. Um, I don't think Reframe never really expected there to be a Me Too explosion or um, any of that happening on October 5th. And obviously, everybody's trying to deal with everything at the same time. So um, let me move. Oh, hang on. I can do this myself. Um, let's back up for a minute and just remind ourselves. These are going to be relatively s familiar statistics to most of you, I think, by now. But just as a reminder, as we, do as we, as we dive in here, what you see here is a, is a graph reflecting the last 10 years. At the bottom, you see 4% of women directing the top 100 uh, grossing the top grossing 100 films. This year, the number is 8%, which is an excellent increase. But if you include this year with its former nine years, you're still at 4%. OK? And what we want to remember, and, and, and by the way, I'm only using directing as an example. It's really quite similar and only worse for the other gatekeeping positions. So we can use this as a map to see where we are today. So for um, as, we, as we go in this movement from narrative short films through independent narrative films through episodic television and top grossing films, you see there's a plummeting happening for opportunity. It is a decrease of opportunity that works alongside the increase in financial opportunity. So just remember that that is literally as money enters the equation, opportunity for women diminishes. OK? And some of the reasons why are there are gendered financial barriers up there at the top that affect the whole particular, you know, the whole, the whole trail. Uh, there are points of resistance, which I have up in the upper right-hand corner. These are uh, people not believing that the low numbers are real, having a lack of trust in the power of these numbers. 
um, believing that women are faring better than they were in the past, which is kind of true, right? I just said there's an 8% this year. However, we're still in a super trend and we're way below 50. And if it's already getting better, why keep focusing on it? And thirdly, believing that the inclusion problem is just as bad in other industries, so why focus here? Um, looking at the same trends, um, critics of the movement, um, exemplary of this gendered marketplace that we talk about at the top there, are that women make films that um, are not what Hollywood wants, that their first films and whatever opportunities they're given to do their first films are in fact poor samples for larger films, stunting the pipeline, and that um, women only show interest in small independent films. All of this probably feels ridiculous at this point, right? Because you've all been focusing on this movement now for a while. So these are starting to probably feel kind of like, duh, you know? However, we can't forget that this hasn't changed yet. Okay, so all these points, you know, every time we're out there in the marketplace and we're talking, you still have to remember all this stuff and keep it alive because we don't have a trend change yet that's per that, that, that numbers can, can grab. Um, so, oh, I, that's the wrong button. That's still the wrong button. There we go. So moving on to reframe. Okay, so um, You've heard a little bit um, about Reframe probably through the news and a little bit of what Franklin just said in that little Q&A right there. And um, let me take you back for a minute. Um, seven years ago, um, I was standing on a stage and I was once again announcing the flatline statistics for women. And it was really like a crisis moment for me in the sense that I was like, I can't run an organization called Women in Film and do this one more time. It's terribly embarrassing besides the fact it's awfully frustrating. And all we had at that point were, were studies that had started, thankfully, in 1998 by Martha Lausen, who was at the end of the year counting up how many women did this or did that or did this or did that, and those numbers were flatlined. But what we didn't have was research on why women were falling out. What were the inflection points that were causing women to fall out along their whole trajectory? So what we wanted to do is we wanted to look at women from their first film or their first television show through their third film or television show, which, by the way, was a tricky endeavor because we lost over 55% of our control group going from film one to film two. Okay, so by the time we're getting to two to three, we really were dealing with a large handful of people. It's not, not, not a group bigger than this room um, that we were studying because there wasn't a group bigger than this room. And we were looking at these inflection points and fallout points. And we began a campaign that became a three-year campaign to raise awareness. We, we funded, as I'm sure many of you know, the Annenberg Research by Stacey Smith. And we partnered during that same period with the Sundance Institute to spend three years raising awareness for what was happening in the industry and also uh, making this research available within the industry and outside of it. And, and um, you know, it was kind of amazing. You know, when, when I started at the beginning of that seven-year mark, I really couldn't get a single story in a trade paper. There had not been a story in a trade paper about what was happening in Hollywood in terms of gender and overall inclusion. And now we can't go a day, right? So that's cool if we could do something about it, right? <laughs> so we felt really good for about a minute, two and a half years ago, when we had front page stories in the New York Times and the LA Times saying, look at this big problem. But now we have the real problem, which is what are we going to do about it? And that's where the, th the concepts around reframe are born. And really, the biggest, the biggest issues that we, that leaders in the movement had been suffering, you know, from over the last, I'm going to say 20 years, but really it does reach back to the beginning of all of this. We can reach all the way back into like the 60s and 70s, but let's just start in the mid 90s and go from there so that we don't get lost in a short conversation. And I'm watching my little numbers. Um, so, so basically what was going on is that um, uh, we didn't know how to get the information embraced by the industry because we had human resources. We all know how conflicted that is now. Um, although I have a great belief that human resources needs to exist and these are important people in any company. It's just a question of how can they be uh, protected to tell the truth. And we had a, a lot of not-for-profits trying to hit at the walls of gigantic multi-billion dollar corporations. So Reframe was really born by the concept that we're going to need leveraged partners um, to communicate to those companies in Hollywood 
that can make decisions about which content to finance. In the end of the day, that is the, inf the, the, the target will always be who can make decisions about which content to finance. Because if you can get in there, right, if we can all get in there, we can change this whole thing. And the question is, who are they going to believe and how is it going to be done? And so we had this idea to bring together, as Franklin mentioned, 50 industry leaders to um, start talking about all this. And this is a picture from the beginning of it all. It really feels like kindergarten now, doesn't it? Um, but it was the beginning. And it was a funny day. I just wanted to give you like a little bit of sense of it because all these people work at various studios and agencies and things and normally spend all day hating each other. So we walked into the Pacific Design Center where this was organized and everybody like took their phone and clung to a wall like this, like all around the room and there was nobody in the middle except a bunch of chairs where we were supposed to be meeting. And by the end of two and a half days, having thrown our phones in the basket, so to speak, and really focused on this, prog progr this progress, it was in fact like kumbaya. But we didn't do it ourselves. What Reframe did is we brought in specialists, a specialist in social change, systemic change, social scientists, um, econometricians, et cetera, because we didn't pretend that we knew the answers. We just knew that we had to understand what kind of culture change could happen, how has it happened in other industries, if at all, and how could we apply any of that thinking to our process. And what came out of all of that, going back to this slide for a minute, is that we shared, uh, let me do, we shared at this, uh, at this meeting essentially what had happened in the research phase where we had collected about 90,000 data points about these subject matter, matter and had also done 1,500 industry inter interviews with men and women with over seven years worth of experience. And what came back, in fact, um, was all, we could categorize it all on three sides of a triangle. By the way, the triangle often used in systemic mapping and thinking the concept behind it is that when, when areas are pushing against each other, um, unless they're all strengthened by the angles of the triangle, the triangle will collapse. And everything that we found in those 90,000 data points either fell under the left side of the triangle, um, oh God, I have a backwards triangle here, right here, but I usually do it the other way around. The left side of the triangle where you see at the bottom culture change. So that is... Um, what's happening in our companies? Who are we hiring from the board down? Once we're hiring to make content, who are we hiring and what comes out at the other end? Under there, there were thousands of ideas and problems, right? On the right side of this particular tri triangle, you see expand the pipeline. What's happening to the pipeline? If it's there, why aren't we seeing it? If it's not there, what do we need to do to increase it? Why is there such a disconnect, you know, in terms of the decision makers in the pipeline? And most importantly, I think, from an industry standpoint, was the baseline, which is build the business case. What, what is the marketplace out there? Um, you know, do we understand who is, in fact, consuming content? Are we listening to them? Are we reaching them? Can we get to them? Um, and so what Reframe essentially spent its few days doing at the beginning was figuring out how could we start to um, introduce this concept to the industry and how could we create programmatic ideas that could be collectively embraced by the whole industry at the same time so they'd be easier to understand as opposed to all different places doing different things, which by the way we also embrace, but the concept was, and we not only embrace, we, 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 we push that information out consistently, but what we wanted to do is say could we get some baseline going on? here? Could we all try a couple of ideas first just so that it's not so unfamiliar every time somebody stands up and says, where's the inclusion? And, and then we took that same group of, of Reframe ambassadors, that first group, and they trained actually for over a year to go out on these meetings. And it's been really hard. I mean, we've, we've been out there, I think we've been to 18 companies so far, generally about 10 ambassadors from the original 50 show up. You can imagine the scheduling nightmare. I've had three assistants quit. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, we're just bonusing them a lot. But no, um, you know, trying to organize this. And then we meet with a very, very top management. And the concept is if there's a producer, let's say a senior producer with a big deal on a, uh, at a studio saying to that studio, hey, it matters to me. If it doesn't matter to you, I'd be happy to bring my business elsewhere. You can see how the leveraging works. It's not meant to be a blame game, but it does require some leveraging. It is very hard to change the course of these companies. And as I've said, we're seeing little change in the most entrenched companies and quicker change in not only the companies that are newer, 
and younger, but also the companies that are more in touch with audiences. I don't think, by the way, and I'll watch this, I'll have to read this later in the paper and never work again, but, but I don't think it's a total coincidence that the very same companies that are struggling to have their content embraced on the weekend through ticket sales at the box office are also the ones who are rejecting a lot of this thinking. It's being out of touch with the real marketplace and who makes up, you know, our audiences and, and what is the real reality of our, um, you know, our community and culture in the United States. Okay, so we talked about them. That's a list of the original members of the ambassador team. I'm sure you know many of them and the kind of jobs that they held running from running. This is people running studios, running networks, running uh, and owning um, agencies, being partners, and a number of guild leaders. Um, oh, as well as talent, of course. Um, so three areas to focus on in our last few minutes here of Reframe. First and foremost, um, uh, let me catch up with myself. Okay, we wanted to address the pipeline issue with a new form of mentorship, as you all would think of it, which is, I mean, I think we, many of us think of mentorship as I need to lean in, I need to give people that are emerging a couple of words of advice, but what we haven't done so much in this country that's been better embraced in other countries in the form of apprenticeship is long-term sponsorship of emerging voices. So when we started all this, we, 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 wherever we went, we asked the question, can you name 10 female film directors fast? And is there anyone in this room who thinks they can do it? Because I would love to see if somebody finally can. Okay. Maybe somebody could and you're just shy. However, that's pretty bad, right? Okay, so what the concept became, how are we going to take a list of less than 10 and over the next number of years really turn it into a list that everybody in this room could, could mention, not just 10? So what we're doing is we've created a sponsorship program wherein all the partners that are, that are involved in, in Reframe, so the studios and networks and guilds that have signed on and some of which was announced the other day and you saw, led wonderfully by Netflix, who really deserves a hand of applause for that, um, being the biggest company and the first, you know, to really put their 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 um, confidence behind this, um, what we basically are trying to do is that we'll start with six directors, we'll move on to six producers, writers, composers, etc. Six, can we get cross sponsorship happening across the country, across the um, companies, the company, the country? Okay, the companies. Can we get? So the same person to be sponsored by an executive at Universal, an executive at, at, at uh, ABC, a streamer at Amazon, a agent that, an agent that may not even be their own, a guild member who's taken the time at a senior level to work with this woman so that this person can, in fact, move into jobs and get six or eight calls when it's time for a job, even if it's not at your own, con at your own studio. So that's the first program. It's small, it's bespoke, but it's crucial. And believe me, it's been hard to get it done. To even get senior sponsors to take the time it would take to two or three times a year meet with six people or one of six people in a significant way, okay? Um, the second side of the triangle we need to address is, of course, the business case. Um, the reframe stamp. So the idea here is that we have introduced, and it'll be up and on our websites shortly, um, the idea of a stamp that's given to productions that exhibit um, gender forward and inclusive processes and policies in putting together their um, productions. And um, the reason we're starting on our own website is Certainly, certainly would be nice if the studios and networks would put this um, on their advertising and on their shows and, and on their movies, but not yet. We hope that they'll start to see this as a brand that means excellent quality and they'll want to use it in the same way that we use the lead stamp or many people know the PGA mark or um, uh, even the restaurant ABC, I hope not worse, um, DF <laughs> in a restaurant and that that sign of quality brings you to it. We also know that younger people, especially Gen Z, likes to know what how their content was made and how what they eat was made, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a caretaking to how does something come to us. And the stamp essentially um, involves a criteria. And if you do, in fact, include women in four of any of these areas with double points being awarded to films that put 
um, women of color in these positions. And by the way, I hope that does not sound tokenistic, but honestly, if we're not using numbers, we don't know what else to do. We're trying to hold people accountable. So numbers and counting is crucial. As much as it sounds ridiculous to say you get a double point to have a woman of color, that makes me nauseous, but it is what it is, right? And so we're trying to say, do it, do it, get your points. And if you put four, and if you, if you satisfy four of these categories, you get the stamp. And um, algorithmically, the way this works, I think, is interesting to say, if you actually satisfy this and get the stamp, you're essentially recreating um, a population reflection in your piece of content. In other words, it doesn't bring you to 50-50. It brings you into a direct response to the very same marketplace that you're serving. And then over time, hopefully, we can continue to increase it. This is the scariest part to the companies. Some have signed on, thankfully. But the notion that one movie or one show could get it and another wouldn't is terrifying. Um, so we're working really hard to have this embraced. And again, a few have. And in the third area, um, oh God, which I'm supposed to have. Can I take two more minutes? Okay. Um, in the th I didn't know how long that video was, so I planned this slightly oddly. Okay, so um, in the third area, which is addressing uh, the culture. How do we make the decisions about what you do? When you all walked in today, I think you saw a bunch of um, poster boards that were um, showing you what we call the production roadmap. And I'm only going to give you one or two examples because we don't have time. Um, but if you look at this black banner across the top of this slide and the next slide, I certainly don't think you could read these slides from here, um, you'll see that what they're meant to do is to give you best in practices ideas on how to handle all of these different inflection points from accepting material at the beginning and developing and hiring people to work on it to these things that happen towards the end, which are your marketing and distribution, managing critical opinion, and working with agencies throughout. And what we did is we essentially scoured good ideas and invented good ideas and worked with experts um, to find good ideas. And all of this is on the Women in Film and Reframe and I believe Sundance websites um, will also be made available to you at the end of this event today. And um, for example, you can't really read it here, but one of the things that's had a lot of resistance but has been in an idea that's been around for 11 years when you're talking about screenplays, remove the cover pages. What's the resistance from? Well, it's really hard. Those PDFs are kind of hard to manage. Well, if we can send people to the moon and do many other things, we can remove a PDF page. But that is the single reason why people don't remove the PDF, that page. But if you do, Franklin himself would tell you that two years ago at the Blacklist when they did this, they had a 35% increase in the amount of women and people of color who made the top 10 and 20 lists at the Blacklist. 35% because of the bias that exists in terms of how you determine your thoughts based on who wrote it, not just necessarily if it's a woman or a man, but what culture you might presume they're from or what religion or what ethnicity. If you look down here at budgeting, number six, you'll see why can't women break in as line producers? Huge, huge, bad, you know, uh, um, uh, um, fallout point. Well, because I think somebody mentioned it earlier, it's way easier to call up that guy you knew before who did your last shows and just say, throw us a budget as, as fast as you can. Perfect place to say to a woman who you haven't worked before, let's see your budget first shot. Maybe they'll do such a good job. Maybe you'll do the man and the woman, see what they do. And if you see that good work, hire them to continue on the project. So this goes all the way through, as you can tell, the entire process. And you can sp spend some time yourself. We've given this tool to studios and networks which is a measuring success tool where they can rate all of these things and also contribute ideas that we didn't think of in the Reframe Toolkit itself, which is the end of my presentation. And thank you so much.